to many people in this room as president of uh, Turner Entertainment Networks, overseeing TNT, TBS, True TV, TCM. Because of their stability under Steve's leadership and, and his other uh, colleagues in the executive suites, these have become some of the most valuable assets at Time Warner, so it's a tribute to him. After uh, we finish today, he's jetting off to LA to the TCM Film Festival. As I understand it, there's a Vanity Fair party after. So between Media Post, Vanity Fair, he's, he's spending the week with probably the two most influential publications out there. I understand there might be something with Hollywood Reporter, but we won't mention that either. Steve's one of the smartest executives in the business, and which is a benefit for us. He's irresistibly candid. So thanks for being here. Uh, so we're heading into the upfront season. Uh, I'll bring it up. Last year, the Turner 2011 upfront. As long as they talk about the upfront, they're going to talk about Turner then. But as someone would have written, it was the day when the lights went out on Broadway, but Steve Coonan saved the day with quick thinking and comedy chops. Yes, he did. <laughs> You're in the front row. You see some lights go out. We're all thinking Conan's coming out, but you came out. What, what happened there? Um, wow. The first question, thank you. Um, we like to start tough. Everybody, please come to our front this year to see if we screw it up. <laughs> uh, it, unfortunately, we have a belief at um, TNT and TBS that mistakes of aggression are applauded. Okay. And when we made the decision to move to broadcast week in the upfront, it was a fairly audacious decision at the time. Nobody had, from cable had been there. And so we had to prove that we belonged. So every year, we upped the technology, we upped the technology, we upped the technology. Last year, we had eight different screens. We had over 200 feet of fiber optics lining the walls. And quite frankly, we made a mistake of aggression. We overwhelmed the system when all the people were in there and all the Blackberries and phones were in there. It, it literally just made the system go crazy. Well, as I said, you covered well. Tribute to you. Um, and I assume you had nothing planned, so you got up there. No, I had nothing planned. My favorite line was, I'm Steve Coonan, formerly of Turner Broadcasting. You're, Obviously, that didn't come true. You're or still here, here today. a year later. Yes. Um, but after everything settled down. Now, if we, oh. do it, if we screw it up again, it will be, it will be true. Right. Well, I, I, it's a pretty good bet. It won't happen. But uh, after everything settled down, you continued to highlight your programming. Now, cable networks change taglines all the time. TBS and TNT, you've been pretty stable. You're going back eight years plus, I believe, for each one. Um, now I believe you're ramping up the drama aspect at TNT, focusing on that. Are you confident that the drama and comedy posi positioning for both networks will continue to put you in that first group of networks people turn to when they turn on the set? Yeah, I think one of the big confusions in cable or in, in television is there's a giant difference between a tagline and a brand. And TBS and TNT have built brands focused on the psychographics of the comedy genre and the psychographics of the drama genre. And one of our acid tests of are we a brand is can advertisers tie in with us without tying in with our shows? And from Baskin Robbins to Honda, from Parker Brothers Games, we've repeatedly had advertisers tie in with the genre of comedy and drama via TBS and TNT. A tagline is important. We know drama and very funny because TBS and TNT don't mean anything. History Channel's pretty clear what it's about. Comedy Central, Food Network, they've got some clarity. And TNT and TBS are alphabet soup. So when you're named for the creator, and I don't mean that one, I mean Ted Turner, right. um, then we had to make this, the tagline stand for something. So we know drama and very funny are, are almost substitutes for the network because they tell consumers and viewers what to expect. We define who we are, we deliver against that. Now you talk about what to expect. Uh, and you mentioned advertisers, but you know, on cable, uh, even with the good deal of blue chip shows you have on the two networks, you know, an advertiser will buy a run of schedule so their ads can run at all hours. What are you doing with those brands in mind to create a stronger advertising environment in those off hours? 
well, then it's not prime time and you have your best stuff going. We, we don't look at it that way. We, we look at it as that we have a 24-hour promise, both to the advertiser and, and most importantly to the viewer, because that's how success works for both of us. And so by building a, a genre-based um, network, we're able to build opportunities. So, you know, life is very funny. We're able to echo that throughout the day with advertisers. Life is very dramatic. You know, me getting here two or three dramatic episodes this morning. So those areas of focus are something that we highlight and we bring to life. We don't do billboards brought to you by. We do take our brands and we envelop our clients' brands in our brands so that they're associated with messages that hit attributes of their brands. And we don't look at it prime time run of schedule. We do it as a 24-hour promise. So let's talk about some of the original and blue chip programming that I suppose does uh, garner those premium CPMs, et cetera. Uh, we played the Dallas theme song Yes. as we came in. That's a huge emphasis for you this summer. You started promoting it. So, I mean, this is a little cliche, but bears asking, are you confident this sort of new generation of viewers will embrace the Ewings and their schemes and schisms? Well, I, I think on any show, the first thing that, to attract viewers is that it has to be good. And it's good. You've seen the pilot. What do you have, think? I thought it was very good and compelling. I did. Thank you for coming today. Yeah. <laughs> Checks in the mail, right? Yeah. No, I'm not paying you. I'm paying them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's very good. And so it is what we call our popcorn mindset. It is just a big, juicy soap. It's for one hour escape, watch the Ewings, aspire to their wealth, be turned off by the way they kill each other, you know, verbally, not physically, and just enjoy, because it's just a bigger than life soap opera. So I think it'll find an audience. I think it'll find an audience of multiple generations. Um, I, and I think great storytelling will find an audience. How, how, what was the genesis of that? Was that something you guys came up with, the former producers? Did Larry Hagman show up and say, I'm retired, I need money? Now, what what you, happened? About four years ago, Michael Wright, who heads our West Coast um, programming from TBS, TNT, and TCM, called me and said, I got pitched Dallas today. And Dallas is a show that I, I loved. I, I literally, if I might digress for a second, um, I, I met my wife in a deli, what a shock, in um, <laughs> March of 1983. And I, like six weeks later, I called to ask her out. And she said, I'd love to go out with you, but you've asked me out on the final episode of Dallas for the season. <laughs> so I, can we do it another time? And I said to her, I have a VCR. We can go out and we'll come back to my apartment and watch it. And 27 years later, I've been married to her. So that was season six, episode 132. <laughs> and I know that because she doesn't know when our first date was, and I do. So that should be worth some points. So you so, think, oh, I was, please. So I'd been a fan of Dallas. So when Michael called me and asked me, I, I was very skeptical because I think some things are best left the way they were, preserved you know, for, for history. And he said, what do you think about developing it? I heard a really incredible pitch on it. I said, yeah, sure. So we, we put it out that we were developing it, got a tremendous amount of press. And we got back the script, and he called me and he said, I got back the script, and it's phenomenal. And I said, send it to me. And I don't rarely read scripts and challenge him what he, he does, because I know what I'm good at and what he's good at. And I read the script. And I thought it was brilliant. I got chills from it. And so we um, shot a pilot, tested incredibly well. People have liked it, including David. And um, we're going for it. We're so going you, for it. You think it'll make it to season six, episode 132 of the new? Uh, from your version? lips. OK. Um, Does that mean I get another wife? <laughs> no. Uh, no. Moving on. Moving uh, on. Dallas Bad is one idea. of nine original dramas TNT will have this summer. Uh, it also marks the end of The Closer. Yes. And if we sort of look at the arc of cable and, and now this emphasis on original programming, if The Shield started it on FX, the launch of The Closer in 2005, 
I think has played an immense role in springing that forward on networks like AMC, et cetera. Um, you're gonna lose a lot of rating points with it. You have a spinoff coming, et cetera. But I think sentimentally, it, it's gonna mean a little something to you. Yeah, the, the closer was a seminal moment, not just for us, but for cable, because it was the first show on cable that did broadcast type ratings. And it also, Kira won the Golden Globe and the Emmy in that role, which was very important because Talent is the key to our strategy. We don't make hit shows, executives don't make hit shows, talent does. And for talent to be able to win an Emmy for Best Actress on TNT sends a big message to the community. And that's the community that is very important on creating great drama and great comedy. So it is something that will be sorely missed, but you know, we're kind of sanguine with it. All good things need to come to an end. Um, we have done if I'm not mistaken, I think we'll finish at 106 episodes, which is the most scripted episodes, I think, in the history of cable. Was that a transformational show uh, beyond reputation and affiliate fees, et cetera, with the advertising community? Yeah, it was transformational on every level. Um, it, it, it was the first show that would have broken the top barriers of rankings and ratings with broadcast. Um, so it was it both had consumer and commercial appeal. And it gave us a launch pad for a lot of success. Rizzoli and Isles spun from that. Um, hopefully the new Eric McCormack show, Perception, that'll be behind the last few episodes will spring from that. So it was good on all levels and it'll be sorely missed, but it's part of the cycle of television and our cycle of life and we're excited about what we have going. So Perception, Dallas, major crimes are coming in and the closer's coming to an elegant conclusion. How much now where you are and the budget you have to spend on original programming, are, do you find Michael and his team are competing uh, during the pitch and pilot process to get some of the broadcast shows? Uh, I thought my boys could have been on NBC, and gosh, they need the help, as a, as a good comedy on Thursday nights. You had it on TBS, it didn't necessarily well, work. I mean, it, it certainly could have. Betsy Thomas, who is the showrunner, just with show running a broadcast show. So I, I definitely think we compete. I think we compete with everybody yeah. um, for good ideas. One of the, the positive things is a lot of our people spend a lot of their time looking for ideas. Rizzoli and Isles was bought at a um, newsstand at an airport. It was a paperback book that somebody was going from Boston to LA, picked up the book, read it on the plane, called a producer when they got back and said, I think this could be a series. And it's been one, that and the closer have jockeyed for number one and number two, yeah. you know, in, in ratings. Um, Sanjay Gupta's Monday Mornings with David E. Kelly is something that um, we just wrapped the pilot last week. It's David E. Kelly's first effort with, um, with Cable, and he thought of us, Steven Spielberg. We approached him on Into the West eight years ago, and what we did is we did an assessment of all of the movies that run on TBS and TNT and look at the themes of what producers kind of do the best, what movies respond the best, and that's become our target list. So Ron Howard, Steven Spielberg, Dean Devlin, those are the people we've gone out to, and we've had pretty good success getting them to create product for us. Now, when we talk about TNT currently, I know you have a couple original comedies coming. You're excited about those. You know, you've had a bit of a dry spell. At the same time, you've had an enviable bridge uh, in the Big Bang Theory, um, the hit CBS show. Uh, it's, it's done you some good. Is it possible this could be considered the smartest, or do you want to admit luckiest, syndication acquisition we've ever seen? Well, if I get a choice of smartest or luckiest, I'll take smartest. Um, but I, I think, you know, the, the acquisition business is a very difficult business, and it's one that's necessary to cable. While broadcast is tasked with 22 hours of prime time a week, right. we're tasked with 168 hours. TBS and TNT don't have any infomercials. They have nothing but a 24 by 7 schedule. So buying a series of acquired movies and shows is a key piece, especially as we build that tone and brand that we're so religious about. You, you, you want to be able to promote to people during the late evening and day who you want to come to you for Prime. And so the voice of the network is very important. TBS 
has a 24-hour comedy schedule. TNT has a 24-hour drama schedule. And those include a lot of acquired shows. Big Bang Theory, um, again, proves the axiom that a great comedy has value. I mean, look at Seinfeld. I think it went off the air in 1998. And it's still playing on 200 local stations and doing well on TBS. So Family Guy, nine seasons in, it's ubiquitous in its presence. But it's a leader on TBS and on Adult Swim. And so it's buying the right things. It's using them to set the tone. And then it's building on them. We have an opportunity with Big Bang Theory that we have to capitalize on in building original comedies. That being said, that's not an easy task. Make, building quality original comedies takes time, it takes patience, it takes you know, great skill, and it takes a lot of luck also. So we're, we're very hopeful and excited. We have a launch platform which is attractive to creators to come to, um, but it, it, it's always gonna be a challenging piece for everybody because when you look at the whole spectrum of, co of television, there's only probably five or six high quality breakout hit comedies on television today. Now so. you sort of answered the question by saying Seinfeld all these years later continues to be a hit, but 64% of your primetime hours now are made up of Family Guy and Big Bang. That will change greatly over the next couple of years as we move to much more original programming year round. So, okay, uh, besides the two comedies coming, that development yes. process will ramp up. I assume something, uh, that you'll face, and you mentioned this, comedy is a lot harder, it seems, to come up with than drama, but there has been a resurgence on broadcast TV. Does, does that give you any confidence? That oh, the, absolutely. Yeah. You know, there's been a resurgence, but there hasn't still been a bunch of big breakouts. So again, comedy is kind of what today, what music was years ago. It's wildly subjective. What's funny to you might not be funny to me. It's incredibly subjective. Younger audiences, comedy is a magnet for you, young audiences. That's why TBS has got the highest reach in television and the youngest audience when you combine the two. Its average age is 35. Its reach is number five just to the four broadcasters. Um, and, and young people like a different form of comedy. It's more um, edgy. It's a very different form than broadcast television comedy. In Big Bang Theory, you're seeing it appeal to, you know, in the movie business, they call it a four quadrant when it appeals young male, young female, older male, older female. Big Bang Theory almost is a four quadrant on its own. And you started to sort of position it as your own. It runs half an hour a week on, on CBS. It, uh, you got a lot of it. We uh, very much want to try to make that appear. You know, rerun's not a very sexy positioning. You want people to think the T is more important to the show than the C. CBS, TBS. Oh, there you go. I don't know. I don't know. I threw that Stick out to your day job. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Just no, that's kidding. fine. It's, uh, um, hopefully I'll be able to do that. Okay, good. Yeah. I, I, what's important is that people understand it's brought to you by TBS. Because yeah. in a brand, a brand is about building trust. And if we procure shows and curate shows that people like, then we get, a, we get value from being a place that they go. And that conscious consideration drives a lot of the ratings and it drives a lot of the reach. Because if you're not on somebody's radar screen, it's very hard to get them to watch you. I should mention, uh, and you can compensate me uh, as you wish, that uh, largely on the back of the Big Bang Theory, TBS was the number one network in cable in the first quarter. And I believe that was without any original comedies. So well, that's somewhat, did that's, I, am I missing that a little bit? Yeah, we, we did have original comedies okay. in Tyler Perry yeah, on right. Friday night, okay. which is doing terrific. Um, so we did, but okay. we still are number one, so thank you very All much. Right, I thought I'd say that. Uh, you can't talk TBS without talking Conan. Uh, there's been a lot written about it. Did it meet expectations, didn't it? So let's get the latest. You just re-signed him, obviously a big financial commitment. This is not a dirty word or a dirty couple of words. Is it a lost leader? No, no. Conan is very, very profitable, first of all. But more importantly, Conan signed with TBS and came to TBS because it goes back to that axiom that I talked about, appealing to talent. Conan's, Conan and his writing staff have been nominated for dozens and dozens of Emmy Awards. And in a world where comedy is hard, you want to be associated with somebody 
who is an expert at comedy. When Conan came to TBS, um, that had to form a brand new consumer habit. People weren't looking at Late Night for TBS, they weren't looking at Conan for TBS. Mm -hmm. He was coming off such an incident with NBC that it was something that um, we had never experienced. And in today's electronic age, everybody got a chance to participate and to have a voice in. When he came to TBS, it came with great fanfare, the ratings went up, the ratings went down. But it was kind of like, in, in our minds, we have to build the habit. And one of the ways you build the habit is to build consistency on the schedule. And now that we've added Big Bang Theory, which we had had planned, and we have our plans moving forward, you see Conan very comfortably move into number two behind Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert, who have been on the air dozens of years and who are superb television, absolutely wonderful, nine times in a row winning the Emmy. And we're very happy with Conan's position because what he's brought us is what we want. It's the youngest by far. He's 20 years younger than um, You're talking about young, uh, the younger audience. viewers and, and advertisers. Yes. I'm sure you're going to tell us like that. He, he's, you know, the average age of Conan's 35. Right. His audience was born when Reagan was president. Leno's was born when Eisenhower was president. Or Truman, one of them. Truman? Um, <laughs> Not William Henry Harrison, though. Could have been. Okay. Uh, we'll have to look we'll it up. Look it up. All right. But um, so he, he's, you know, younger than Kimmel, Letterman, yeah. Leno, they're all in their 50s. Conan's in his 30s. He has, um, and you'll see shows coming from Conan in the future to TBS from his production company. You um, will see Conan be prominently featured in our brand advertising. And we believe he's an iconic voice of comedy, and he's one that we're incredibly thrilled to have. It's profitable, it's funny, it's Emmy-nominated, and um, its ratings have grown six months in a row, so. Don't want to slight True TV? No. Uh, knocking on the door of the top 10 networks in the 18 to 49 demo yep. last quarter. Some people might not know that. Uh, hardcore Pawn arguably the flagship of the network. One of the funniest titles in all of television. It is, it is. Now, it's an interesting show, it does very well, but I, I, there's a lot of reality out there on about, there's about six networks and sort of that up close, in your face kind of uh, stuff. Anyway, history is Pawn Stars. Uh, that's the, so we have the Pawn genre, we have the Repo genre, you're big in that. And we have sort of this auction genre where uh, the idea is you go to these uh, abandoned uh, storage lockers. Now, there's sort of a direct line here, right? Spike has auction hunters. A&E has storage wars. True TV has storage hunters. So can there be some burnout among audiences, or are the ratings just the ratings, and that's well, good enough? I think there's a couple of things. One of the things that we spend a lot of time doing, we all live in a world of demographics, and we spend a tremendous amount of time understanding the psychographics. Uh, of the viewers. Sure. Every single person in this room has a video recorder in their pocket. Every single person who has a phone has a video recorder. And that has changed the psychographics of the world. Um, our young audience on True, which is when it was Court TV at an average age of 54, is down to 42, looks at reality TV, as we call it, as just life. They don't segregate it or put it in a bucket or put a designation on it the way that we do in the business. They look at it as a reflection of life. I, when we talk to young people and we say, why do you like this form of television? They say, because it's real. So we all know that it, it, it is real with um, just these outrageous characters. So I think that the derivative shows, one could argue American Idol, The Voice, um, X Factor yeah. are all derivative of Ted Mack Amateur Hour. You know, what was that? any kind of singing competition. I'm going back 60 years okay. or 50. Um, meaning, punked was candid camera. Yep. And so there's so many derivatives off of the core ideas that I think the, the audience will say when they're tired. And right now, those outrageous characters in those situations, while there could be a lot of multiple shows in the genre seem to be doing well. And I think it really propels everybody to search for the next thing. Sure. Uh, do you plan on changing any of the tenor of the reality shows to attract more advertisers? 
or are you pretty satisfied with where you are? You know, I guess the question is, are, is there a group of advertisers that don't want to be on True TV? Obviously, if you're replacing them with people paying more money, that's no problem. Well, I mean, I, I would defer to the salespeople, but this oh. seems to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation, so I'll do my best right. at it. I, I, I think, think you'd look at the numbers. You know, I, I think that it depends on which brand. You know, I, I, I worked and ran marketing for 14 years at Coca-Cola Company. Right. And Coke had some advertising standards that they didn't want to be in these kind of shows or they would be in these kind of shows. And I think what I've learned over time is it depends on the brand. If you're a, a, an Axe deodorant, which might be a Unilever, which I think is a Unilever product, um, Axe has a different standard than other Unilever brands. So I think that one size doesn't fit all. Right. And it depends on who you're talking to and how you want to talk to them and what, what the, the show is. So, you know, I think 45% of all viewing now is coming from unscripted television. Yeah. That's not a trend. That's here to stay. Yep. And if anything, it's growing. And we've seen tremendous growth on True. You've seen it on History. You've seen it on A&E. They all deserve great credit because what they've found is something people want to watch. The audience today... I mean, what other product is brought into your home and dispelled in a nanosecond? The remote control gives the consumer more power over what they want to watch and what brands they bring into their home than any other conscious choice consumer decision. And we have to be cognizant of what people want to watch and why they want to watch it. And that's what we spend a lot of time doing. Let's move to conquering the multi-screen environment. Okay. Now, if you guys are running for political office, someone could accuse you of some flip-flopping. Back in 1988, you guys were a cord cutter's delight. Now, I know that wasn't a term used back then, but I mean, it was like the buffet at the Sizzler. You could go to all your websites, watch full episodes. In 1988? Oh, sorry, 2008. Okay. Apologize. That would be big. Um, and and, and uh, but now you're, you're taking a, another philosophy. I mean, it's like Fort Knox there. Unless you're doing TV everywhere, you're a multi-screen operator, a multi-video, uh, multi uh, MSO a subscriber, you're behind a paywall. Take us through that evolution. I mean, it's been dramatic. Well, I can't speak for the industry, so I'll speak for us. I take great umbrage in what you're saying, because in 2008, we did not put our product out there next day. We did not believe in that. And you couldn't find a TBS and TNT website. We put it out seven days later. Okay. Okay? And the reason for that was that you have... Every decision we make has three constituents. The viewer, the advertiser, and the cable operator. And when you look at the constituent of the viewer, if you train them to watch television without commercials in a better environment, you are not benefiting your other two constituents as well as yourself. And I was always amazed at how networks put out their product for a, watch it here first, preview it here, see it. Well, if somebody's going to go to the trouble of downloading it, sourcing it, watching it on a smaller screen, I would say that they had a high predisposition to watching you in a rated environment where you had advertising. So we didn't believe in that. In fact, our fervor um, for making sure that people watched our show with our commercials led us in 2009 to work with Cox Cable. In Phoenix, Arizona, we did a test on video on demand. And video on demand had Usually next day, we were seven days, the only ones in the industry. And so we said, we will give you our products seven next day, but you have to run a full commercial load. And we will measure it. We'll use set-top box data, so it's precise data, your data. And to make a long story short, the results were stunning, that we had 19% growth in VOD viewership, and people watched, time spent viewing went up with the commercials because it was like that old Seinfeld bit. There was a bargain with the consumer. When you go to a movie theater, there's kind of this unwritten contract. You pay $6 for a tub of Coke, and you have the right to drop it all over the floor when you're done. <laughs> it's true. It's unwritten, but it's true. On VOD, it's the same kind of thing. You can watch our shows anytime you want, but you need to watch them with commercials. And we've seen this explosion last year in VOD, which drove our C3 indexes to 140, 150, because viewers wanted to watch when they wanted to watch, 
but what they were willing to do was to watch the commercials in order to get that trade off of time. And so we believe TV everywhere is the right idea. We believe that as an American, we have a lot of unalienable rights. Watching TV for free is not one of them, okay? And the cable industry has not done a great job of telling everybody that for the price of less than a Starbucks a day, you get all this hours of all this great news and entertainment and sports for all these people in your home. And what we want to do with TV Everywhere is create incredible consumer value. And TV Everywhere is very misunderstood. If TV Everywhere was a consumer product, an electronics product, we're in 80 million homes in two years, which is more than the DVR, the DVD, and the VCR combined. But what's missing is all the networks coming together to commercialize. I don't know if there's any other network people here today. Um, you don't have to identify yourself. But it would make sense as a group for us to come together, commercialize in one voice, this incredible consumer opportunity where you can watch your favorite shows anytime, anywhere, on any device for no incremental money just by being a subscriber to cable. Now, now you, you, you made a point about the industry coming together. Some of that's about measurement. Clearly, TV everywhere won't reach perhaps its, uh, its, its greatest uh, potential until there's C3 ratings that combine what happens online, Correct. mobile, iPads, et cetera. Uh, Nielsen has a basic system in place. I think you guys have used it. Has that given you confidence that over time there'll be a lift from that viewing off the linear TV? Well, I mean, it's virtually 100% incremental That's true. today. So yes, it's a lift. But more importantly, it's given us an opportunity to, again, satisfy consumer de demand and put our brands in a place where they wouldn't be. If you're on the train, you can watch your favorite shows. If you're flying, you can watch your favorite shows. If you're boredom buster in, in line, you can watch your favorite shows for no incremental cost. That's a great value, and that's what we're trying to get across. I want to move to second screen apps, because okay. that's something you've really moved aggressively in. Uh, you've done it with some shows. Uh, uh, Conan, uh, most recently, with a lot of publicity. Explain what that is, and, and, and what, what is the potential there? <laughs> Again, we, found, we saw a consumer insight that people aren't watching TV anymore, they're, they're consuming it. And they want to share their television like a mother condor feeds her young. Um, if anybody here from Nat Geo, you'll know exactly what that means. Um, and so we created this technology, this ARC technology, that basically is embedded sound. So we've created a Conan Sync app. When you're watching Conan, whether you're watching it live on your DVR or online, you can, this app syncs to, through sound to it, and it allows you to talk socially to other viewers, it allows you to see behind the scenes material, and it creates this immersive interactive experience that I think these sync apps will be a big piece of the future of television. Um, AT&T is sponsoring that, um, and they're on the cutting edge of technology as is this. So if, when you are a fan of a show, and if you can sync your pad, and I think 62%, uh, a recent survey I saw of all people watching television have a tablet or computer with them or nearby, then you're gonna create a two screen experience that's gonna be very interactive. There's opportunities for advertisers to go past the 30 second commercial by syncing and using the technology and being able to connect more information. You'll be able to, we, um, I saw a demo, when you have Melissa McCarthy on from Bridesmaids promoting the movie, you can now click a button and you can buy your movie tickets straight sure. from the sync app sure. while watching her promotional performance on Conan. So we think we're just scratching the surface, but second screen, we also believe that, um, and we're going to do m several multi-screen shows about the shows after they air. Dallas, with its rich mythology, you put on a few notes of Dallas and people in the room instantly knew what was playing. Falling Skies, which is our alien drama that has a deep and rich mythology, we're doing talk shows live on the web immediately after the shows. And so if I had to categorize this as a phase, it would be the experimental phase. We're all trying to learn, we're trying to learn together to see what works and to um, propel the business forward. I wanna move on to social media. Uh, one of the reasons I believe you cited uh, for re-signing Conan, and it is remarkable, 5.4 million followers. The Closer has a million Facebook likes. 
But is this stuff just a marketing tool, which is good, or is there any potential to monetize any of this? I think today it's a marketing tool. Okay. I, I, I really do. I think that um, the, the marketing tool allows you to monetize through the conventional channels. Sure. You know, by building a fan base and by building um, broadcast towers of individuals. We used to call it word of mouth. You know, when I was growing up, you liked a restaurant, you told somebody about it. Now you like a restaurant, you write a review on Yelp. And that review, and you have credibility, helps other people make a decision. So social marketing and social media are huge pieces of our planning. Um, but we want to be careful also not to sell our marketing messages and confuse the viewer. So the profitability comes in increased audiences. Okay. But that's today. Who knows what tomorrow could be? Sure. Uh, Product placement. You guys have done a lot. We know about Brenda and her Twizzlers. Um, done a lot with scripted shows. True TV is another, another animal. What are your criteria for determining whether a product placement should be allowed on a show that's a scripted show? And if I ask you to give us that criteria, can you do it without using the words organic or natural? Probably not, right? Can I have a lifeline? <laughs> you want to phone a friend? Um, sure, I can do it without that. If it propels the story forward, if it's part of a character's composition, if it is a lot of money. Um, <laughs> if the ad salespeople yell at me. Um, you know, a, a character like Brenda, who on the very first pilot episode, you saw this very together woman at work, very scattered in real life, and she, her weakness was for sweets. Then it became a natural, it moved the storyline forward. Um, I've seen them where it, it, it just sticks out like a sore thumb. It it's just makes no sense whatsoever. And, you know, we try very hard to avoid those situations because they're not good for the advertiser. I, I referred that I worked at Coke, and, and Coke product placement reported to me, and what I was able to learn back then was producers and directors use Coke to establish a period. It was especially in period pieces. If you wanted to do a 50s drugstore, you had the Bell soda glass, sure. you had the iconic, sure. you know, contour bottle, and you used Coke to set a time and a period piece. And so it was part of the story. It gave layers of um, credibility, but it wasn't there screaming. And I think good integrations are the ones that, that do that, that are integral to the story, but they don't sit there and scream, look at me, look at me, look at me, and make people go, that's paid for commerce. So product placement brings in revenue. Uh, in this DVR world, what are some new ad models on TV you'd like to experiment with and your ad sales team may be working on? Maybe we'll hear about them at the upfront. Well, I mean, th there's a tremendous amount of innovation that, that's going on. We have, we built our own internal agency called The Sponsor Shop, um, who creates products and stories and, and um, opportunities for advertisers to integrate their brands into. Um, I think one of the best innovations I've seen really happen in sports with NASCAR, and that's when it's, the race is still going on and the advertiser has visibility and, and, and actually gets credit for allowing you to see more racing. And, and I wonder if advertisers are taking advantage of the opportunity to, to ingratiate themselves with, with viewers. I used to see um, limited commercial brought to you by advertisers. Right. That has real consumer value. Mm -hmm. That has real advertiser value. And you haven't seen a lot of those things going on lately. And I'm sure it's a function of price and sellouts and those type of things. But you know, when, when I was an advertiser, I wanted something that I could differentiate my brand with. And that was appealing to me and something that I, I could say that um, I could take to retail or do things. I think the biggest key is communication far in advance. You know, we're developing for 2013, 2014 now. We just finished a tour in early March seeing 
eight different major ad groups showing them things that we're looking at a year in advance. And I think by getting in front of advertisers far in advance, talking development, showing ideas, we'll be able to create some new and interesting opportunities. A lot of advertisers have expressed they'd like to get potentially into the programming business. Well, that takes, that's a lot, because that's not their core business, and that's not an easy business to be in. It has a high failure rate, and it doesn't have the certainty of advertising. But again, with good communication and clarity, um, and trying to build real partnerships, I think it's achievable. Let's go to questions. Does anyone have uh, one? Right back there. Hi, I'm Scott Collins. I'm with AMC. And uh, I personally want to break uh, probably um, confidence with my company and say I'm thrilled that you're bringing Dallas uh, to the air. It's my favorite show of all time. I myself made my wife in my first year of marriage watch every episode, 357 of them, and she's still married to me, so that's amazing. Anyway, um, Larry Hagman, uh, was it difficult to get him back uh, to do the show? Uh, how's his health, and, uh, and how many episodes are you planning on doing? Um, Larry Hagman is, is an amazing man. I think about three weeks before we went into production, um, we found out he had throat cancer. And that, obviously that was horrible news on so many levels, especially for Larry's health. He's 80 years old. And he was supposed to be in the first episode, the second episode, miss five or six episodes, and then come back for the last two. Larry Hagman did not miss one day of shooting. He said being JR is his life. And that's when he's happiest. Um, I've never seen, I've been very fortunate to spend a lot of time with people who are characters, but I've never seen a person be the character. He wears a JR watch, he puts on a cowboy hat, and it's like it's a halo above his head. He just turns into somebody different. So he was very excited. He drove a hell of a hard bargain. It was one day I'll tell the story, not today. He made a very difficult, he is JR, let's just put it that way. <laughs> I was worried about my safety for a while. Anyone uh, else? Oh, but um, thank you, Scott, and I think you're going to really enjoy the show. Uh, yeah, I'm Tim Brooks. Uh, oh. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, the history of revivals is pretty dire. For every uh, uh, Hawaii Five-0, there's 20 Charlie's Angels or Bonanza the Next Generations and that sort of stuff. Uh, what is it about uh, Dallas uh, that uh, you're either doing with the show or perhaps your view of where the audience is today that makes that special? beat those odds. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of things. I think the name Dallas gets us some interest in the first episode. There is some pre-sold demand, there's some nostalgia, there'll be a lot of coverage. But I, it has to work as a TV show. And the storyline, the tack that we took, is it's about the next generation. Christopher, who is Bobby's son, is all about natural energy. And John Ross, who is JR's biological son, it's all about drilling on oil on South Fork. And I don't want to give it away because I want you to watch, and there's about 100 people in here, so that's a tenth of an M <laughs> and a CPM. Um, but Tim, as you know better than anybody in this room, that without risk, we wouldn't have some of the breakthrough television we have today. So we felt this was a risk th worth taking, and instead of looking at the history of failure, we looked at the script and judged it on that, that merit, and we think we have something that's going to be very successful. We have a couple more minutes. We'll do a quick rapid fire on two questions okay. that are of interest to me. Uh, America is becoming more diverse. You've done a lot of good stuff with Tyler Perry. You had George Lopez. How will the uh, evolving uh, population and audience uh, that you try to attract impact programming decisions in the future? We want our television screen to look like the streets. We want to have audiences. We, we believe that we're counterpunchers in cable. You know, th there's been a couple of things. If you look at what broadcast has done that's allowed cable to do what we do. First of all, can you imagine any other business? Can you, think of a mall. Think of television as a, as a mall. Can you imagine the anchor stores of a mall hanging a gone fishing sign from the third week in May to the third week in September. And what's happened is they forced all those people who came to the mall to go to the boutiques, and that's the rise of cable. 
has been because broadcast gave us the opportunity to program during the summer, to build confidence, to build audience, um, and to build our businesses with original programming. I've also forgotten your question. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, programming decisions impacted by the changing ah, uh, population of America. Counterpuncher. Okay. Okay. Right. The second thing we notice right. is that. Glad it was so memorable. Go no, ahead. it was memorable. I, I was working on an answer, then forgot it, and then I'm back. <laughs> the second counterpuncher measure to the mall is that, and we did it with Tyler Perry. There wasn't, and we did it with Hawthorne, with Jada Pinkett Smith. There are no broadcast shows with African American leads. So again, when we look at opportunity for our key constituents, viewers, advertisers, cable operators, being able to develop successful programming to those audiences is good business. And that's what we did. And my apologies for forgetting the second That's all right. Question. And here's the last one. Uh, that wasn't so rapid fire now, was it? It was all right. All right. It was all right. Uh, Slow motion fire. Sorry. What will linear TV be like 10 years from now? What will linear TV be like? Well, I, I'll give you an, the arrogant answer would be nothing will be different. These will all be satellites surrounding it. The humble answer would be I don't know. And the right answer is somewhere in between, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I do think that the television sets become the home and hearth. It's the fireplace, you know, it's where people go for relaxation and escape. It's also where people are now starting to consume TV in a different manner. So I do think that linear television, broadcast television, cable television will continue to play a key, key role. One of the things that always frustrates me when I read prognosticators talk about television is television is very expensive to make. And there is a, there's a, a process to it. Because of advertisers supporting programming, it's able to be funded and produced. If those opportunities go away, who's going to pay for the programming? Where's it going to come from? Where's Netflix going to buy from? Who's going to stream what? So, if you start with, there's $100 billion in television advertising, where does that go? And how are these very expensive shows, like a Mad Men, like a Closer, going to get funded? It kind of gives you a decent feeling that things will change, but the core has a real chance to stay steady and consistent in the same. Thank you so much for your time Thank and you your answers. Um, please help me with the Steve. Thank you. I hope that went well.